community involvement uh, earlier in this long-range development plan. And knowing that, the City Council really wanted to articulate its concern and also, as um, John mentioned, give the community at large a chance to weigh in. And so the City Council did put on its agenda and, and voted to put on the ballot Measure, measure U. Um, and so that's what the um, community will, in the City of Santa Cruz will have the opportunity to vote on in June. So I just want to read you, this is the ballot question. And I want you to, um, when you go home, look on the county uh, website. You'll get it eventually as, uh, in your ballot, in your voter pamphlet. But go on the county election site and look up the text and, and read the, the uh, language of the ordinance that is before the, the voters. So the ballot question that city voters will vote yes or no on is, shall an ordinance be adopted expressing the Santa Cruz community's opposition to the proposed enrollment growth at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And so that, uh, that references the uh, enrollment target in terms of both numbers and date that's put forward in the current, uh, in the proposed long-range development plan. So that's the ballot question. And then there's a, a lengthy, uh, by time up? Almost. Um, uh, I just want to reference the features again um, and urge you to look at them. The purpose of this ordinance is to express the concerns of the residents, to provide guidance to city officials, and to direct city officials to actively and fully participate in the LRDP. And then there, there are many, many other issues that are covered, but uh, the language of this was very thoughtfully put together, so I urge you to look at it, um, consider it, and um, get involved. And I'll just also say, I'm also working on the measure as the city of Santa Cruz with um, declining revenues is trying to meet, continue to meet the needs of its people, which does include, in many respects, the impacts of the growing university. So we put that before the voters and take a look. Thank you so much. I, I should have uh, mentioned from the outset that Cynthia, uh, as you know, has served as mayor. She served on the uh, steering committee for the city when the city was going through the last round of negotiations. And she's with me and she's still with us, so that's great. Thank you. She, she has to leave early for a uh, meeting that she had already previously scheduled, as does Ryan, who, Ryan Coonerty, our, our uh, representative for the Board of Supervisor. And so Ryan, is, we asked him if he could squeeze us in. And Ryan, thanks for coming. And he's going to have to leave, but unfortunately, right after Ryan, go ahead. <coughs> So, uh, first of all, thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for caring about your community, and thank you for getting involved on what could be the single biggest issue facing uh, this community over the next generation, over the next couple years that will affect a generation. Uh, let me start by sort of stipulating three big things that that I think uh, it's always dangerous for one member of a board of supervisors to, uh, to talk about what the whole board of supervisors or, your, or the whole city council. Thanks, especially when there's a stick uh, enforcing, uh, <laughs> enforcing time limits against us. But um, I think we would all, uh, from the perspective of the board and the, the council, I think I can safely say a couple things. One is, we all appreciate the university being here. We appreciate the role that it plays in this community and we understand that it makes this community vital. The second thing is we believe that we are currently in a housing crisis and that adding any additional students will have uh, a potential devastating impact not only on the working people and people in this community, but on the students and faculty and staff who work at the university as well. Um, and that we have to try to limit that growth to, in every way possible. The third important thing to know is that the university is constitutionally exempt from local land use laws. So this is not a situation where you have a developer who brings a project and the council votes four to three or, or five to two, uh, up or down about what happens and then seeks mitigations. This is a very complicated process where the university is working under state mandates um, and the traditional ways that the city council or the board of supervisors might try to regulate them uh, don't exist. So uh, this is gonna take a much more sophisticated and long-term effort to organize in order to combat. Um, so, uh, the Board of Supervisors already voted unanimously, sent a letter to UCSP, to the regents, and to our legislative leaders, 
saying that uh, we cannot uh, take any more growth uh, and that uh, we don't want that to happen. Uh, the city council uh, also took, uh, passed a similar letter and sent that message out. And then uh, I work uh, with my staff and Chris, Chris Crone and Cynthia Matthews and city council members to put an entry you on so that you all can have that opportunity to let the community, the university, the state know what, what you think of the proposed growth. And it's important that we make this statement. It's important as I think is on the agenda, that we win overwhelmingly um, in that effort. So in the short term, the thing I really want you to focus on is spreading the word about Measure U. Uh, traditionally, June elections are a little lower turnout elections, so every vote matters. We're lucky, we're lucky that we're in a small town and when people can just talk to each other and we don't have to do big media buys or other things. So that mobilization really makes a difference. We'll be making an effort to walk door hangers before uh, the uh, absentee ballots go out on May 5th and 6th, and then do it again before the, uh, the June election, before Election Day. Um, the extent that you can give two hours to go out and, and hang some information on people's doors to make sure they're aware of these issues is really important. I think hopefully if you sign up tonight, we'll be in contact and those who are available should do that, but anything that you can do to help further this campaign to make sure that the statement of the community is clear and unambiguous in our concerns and our opposition to University of Rome. Over the longer term, there's going to be a long process. It's going to be a long negotiation. There will be uh, potential litigation. There will be EIRs. There will be community forums. There will be a lot of different ways that people can try to push on this system in order to get change. I think one of the things that we really have to focus on is it is my sense that the university, UCSC administration, understands the housing crisis, understands the impact that the growth uh, without resources is having on their faculty, staff, and students, um, and has real concerns about this mandate to grow. I've also heard this from the regents uh, who came here Chair of the Regents came here, toured around, saw the, saw, the, saw the lack of housing, heard from students about their concerns, heard from faculty and staff about their concerns. So I think we have some sympathy in, frankly, a way that we didn't have in the last LRDB uh, process where there wasn't a lot of interest or understanding of what the impacts of the university on this community are. I think there is now, at the local and potentially a little bit at the, re at the Regents level of this, where this decision is being pushed, or where this growth is being pushed, is from our state legislature. Not necessarily from our legislative leaders, but the state legislature as a whole is seeing an increasing mandate to expand higher education, as they should, uh, in the state of California, and they are pushing to constantly expand enrollment and, then, and, not, even, and not really providing the resources to provide that. Our legislative leaders, uh, Bill Monning, who's the majority leader of the state senate, Mark Stone, who plays an important role in the assembly. We need them to help move their colleagues on how the impact of this uh, potential growth. It's going to be extremely important that we mobilize around the legislature. It's going to be extremely important that we get students and other folks who may have connections to legislators outside of this district to make sure that we are communicating what, that, what life is like on the ground for people who are struggling to make rent or even find a place to live, people who are struggling through traffic and water and, and other issues. So um, over the long term, the thing I want you to think about is how are we going to take our community voice and make that voice heard at a state on a statewide level. Um, they're not going to be sympathetic to our sort of what they perceive as our NIMBY concerns. They're going to be sympathetic to when it's impacting the educational mission and the students and faculty and staff. And we're going to have to really mobilize and think about how we make our voice heard in Sacramento on this, because I think that is going to be, over the long term, the key. In the short term, we've got to win this election. We've got to make sure that Venture U passes overwhelmingly so that it's unambiguous where the community is, so that you all can hold all of your legislative leaders, local, county, uh, and state uh, officials accountable for doing everything we can to prevent um, unmitigated university growth in this community. So thank you.
Okay, um, and now we're going to sort of shift gears and, and Tip Ben Hari, who has represented the Bobby Doon Association, but also was part of the CLUE process and on the uh, steering committee for CLUE for the last cycle. He's going to do a, a brief highlighting of the last process of the agreement. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, Cynthia touched on some of that, so I won't uh, bore you by uh, repeating some of the things that she went into. Um, what I will briefly say, though, uh, is that you know Bonnie Dune is one of the places that will perhaps feel a great impact uh, from university growth if the university does indeed build on the upper campus, the north campus, which now is undeveloped. Uh, and that in the last go around, they plan to put 3.2 million square feet of buildings up there, which Fortunately, uh, we were able to uh, deter up until this point. Uh, if you want to think about what that is, that's about 23 Costco warehouses. So uh, that's a lot of building. Uh, let me uh, say that you know, I kind of have a sense of deja vu being in this room again because this is where we began back in 2005, April 11th, to uh, fight the last LRDP, the 2005-2020 LRDP. Uh, but the battle against UC growth actually goes back a lot further than that, uh, at least to 1988, because in 1988 there was Measure C in the city, and the large majority of city voters uh, overwhelmingly passed that by a 3 1 margin, and that became the stated policy of the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, a key paragraph from that. Not too much feedback, sorry. Uh, should be the policy of the city of Santa Cruz to insist that the University of California limit and phase its rate of growth so that all significant adverse impacts on the community, particularly in the areas of housing and traffic, are fully mitigated. <coughs> Obviously, that does not happen. Right. So the housing mitigation was never uh, carried out, uh, and the 1988 LRDP contained the goals that the university would house 70% of the undergraduate student body. Uh, today, uh, that's 53%, so that's a far short of that goal. 50% of the graduate students, 25% of the faculty, and 25% of the staff newly attracted to Santa Cruz. None of those goals have remotely been met. So, is it possible to mitigate all the adverse effects uh, of the impacts of, on the university? Santa Cruz, as you probably all know, is the smallest town in the UC system. Uh, and it's really, really unique in the fact that we produce all our own water supply, one of the only counties, in the state, or perhaps the only county in the state that does that. Uh, we have impediments uh, geographically that isolate Santa Cruz in a wonderful way, uh, but it also creates uh, a situation where it becomes very desirable and that quality of life is something that we're, we live here for, and we don't want to give that up. The university is the largest growth uh, impetus in this uh, area, and we have had very little control over it, as Ryan spelled out. So, clearly the goal is to get the regions to recognize that Santa Cruz doesn't have the capacity to handle a larger university population. We don't have the housing capacity, we don't have the transportation capacity, and it's unreasonable to ask us to transform our city to reduce our quality of life to meet the needs of the UC system when there are many other places in the state that could easily do that, that would love to do that, uh, to accommodate that growth. And uh, the Merced campus, of course, is the only campus that's been built uh, in the last 50 years, the only new campus. Uh, there's no reason not to build other new campuses and to fill UC, uh, UC Merced up. Get back to the history. Uh, so on September 14, 2005, uh, we met to plan the response to the 2005-2020. Uh, uh, when the regents came here, there was a big demonstration up at the university. Uh, it was the time when they were voting on the EIR. Uh, and students uh, put on quite a show for them. I, I was very impressed. And I, so does many of our community leaders, especially 
the late Marty Wormhout, who worked as part of Cleveland, our negotiating team. Uh, but I, it didn't really uh, impress the regions whatsoever. Uh, so then we all uh, worked with the city to employ one of the only legal tools that we had, and that is the requirement for the university to apply to LAFCO to extend city and water services to the North Campus. LAFCO is a state-level agency, so they have to uh, comply with LAFCO regulations where they don't apply with local regulations. Uh, so there were two measures on the ballot, I and J. They passed overwhelmingly in 2005, but then they were thrown out on the legal technicality. That clue pressed to have those reinstated as part of the negotiations that went on uh, over the settlement for the uh, EIR lawsuit that we filed. And I'm happy to say that those now exist in the city charter once again. So if they do want to build on the North Campus, they're going to have to comply with uh, those regulations, which means that the city would have to put to a vote of, of the people before they could apply to LAFCO to extend services to the North Campus. Um, so I won't go into the history of the negotiations, other than to say that it took almost a year. There were meetings late into the night. Uh, it was highly, highly acrimonious, but in the end, we did get the uh, 2008 settlement. Uh, the language of measures I and J were put into the city charter. Uh, and uh, since 2008, uh, CLU, the city, uh, university, and the county have met regularly to ensure that the provisions from the comprehensive settlement agreement have been met, and I'm happy to report that they have. Relationships with the university are much better than they have been. I don't know if they're going to continue to be that way after this next battle, but uh, we need your support in Clue. Uh, you know, the uh, only thing we have is to uh, raise our voices really loud and clear with our legislators, with our elected representatives, and at the ballot box to try and push this thing back as far as we can. Thank you. And next we have sort of three, four different perspectives. Uh, Jillian Green's side will speak from the neighborhood perspective, and then we're going to have three perspectives from the student, the student perspective, the staff perspective, and the faculty perspective. So, Jillian, why don't you take this first? as head of rape prevention education. The population of Santa Cruz City was around 41,000 and the student population was around 6,000, meaning 15% of the total population of the town was UCSC students. Similar to today, 
about half of the student body lived on campus, and about half lived off campus, or lived in the town. That was about 3,000 students living in the town. Today, 29% of the total population of the city is UCSC students. That is double the percentage from 40 years ago. And similarly, just over half of the students live in town. But today, that number is 9,000, or three times as was in the town 40 years ago. The impact of this massive level of student growth has had significant and negative impacts on our neighbourhoods, traffic, crowding, scarcity of housing, no parking, noise, dislocation of lower income residents who cannot compete for rents with students, many of whom come from higher income families. We know these impacts only too well. Some may, we may not know as well. During my 30 years at UCSC, I learned that students who are disciplined for alcohol abuse, racist or sexist behavior, or other violations of student conduct, invariably lose their on-campus housing privilege. In other words, they are sent to live with us. I always thought that a pretty bad arrangement and said so on many occasions. Nonetheless, it was, and probably still is, the practice, demonstrating a lack of regard for the city off the hill. But without doubt, the most significant impact of UCSD growth on neighbourhoods is the main drive is as the main driver of ever increasing rents and skyrocketing housing values, both of which are designated local crises. To understand how this works, we need to heed the observations of a UCSC financial officer from long ago. In the late 1980s, Don Vandenberg, Versa, that's financial officer of Crown College, cautioned that every additional complex of student housing built on campus raised the rates for all on-campus students by about $100 a month addition. Across the board, since all students living on campus shouldered the cost of on-campus housing. For a variety of reasons, including soils and geology, it is very expensive to build on campus. Thus, rents on campus are always higher than rents in town. And so therefore, downtown landlords adjust their rents accordingly, always upwards. So, more students on campus, more housing built, leading to higher rents on campus, leading to higher rents off campus. Student growth is a formula for ever increasing rents on and off campus. And if the number of students grows to the anticipated 28,000, today's rents will seem low by comparison. Some call for all additional students to be housed on campus, even if that were possible which it isn't. That will not solve the impact on our neighbourhoods in terms of ever-increasing rates or housing costs that such growth will generate. To conclude, the only solution is a cap on UCSC enrolment. I'd suggest 10,000 max, a pipe dream, but at least we need a rousing support for Measure U to send a message to the office of the president that its lack of planning for student growth is not our town's burden to bear. Thank you. Nice. Thanks so much, Jillian. I'm not sure whether, uh, is Chayla uh, Fisher here? Chayla, she is our student leader. Sheila, come on. Great to have you here. Thanks for coming.
name is Shayla Fisher. I am a second year environmental studies student at UC Santa Cruz. I am also a co-chair of the Student Environmental Center and a student representative on the current Long Range Development Planning Committee. So I have recently gotten very involved with this whole <laughs> development process within the past year, and it's definitely been a process to even have the amount of knowledge that I have about it with the support of a lot of my peers and, and people that work with me are here today to support me. So thanks to all of you guys who are here. Um, first of all, um, you know, I, I've been asked to speak on, on the student perspective. And uh, as Ryan said, it's hard to speak on the perspective of everyone, um, especially a large student body that's very diverse. And you know, being a white student, I do have my own focuses and my own experiences on campus. And although I have met with a lot of different student groups that represent different people, I think it's very clear that we all have, uh, while we have similar goals, we have very different ideas of exactly how to get there. Um, but I do think that uh, the one thing that we can agree on is that um, the before any more enrollment is even considered, uh, the current needs of the students and the community need to be met first. Um, and now I want to make sure that the community knows that I think that many of the students do recognize uh, the deep impacts that the university's inadequate planning has had on the community. Uh, you know, we take away a lot of your resources, we increase your housing rice, uh, rent prices, and um, you know, I, I think that we really do need to work together to try and mitigate both the issues that impact the community as well as the students. Um, and I personally want you all to know that, um, you know, I, I know I'm not speaking for all the students, but I do want to work with the community to try and make sure that everyone's needs are met and no one is left homeless or hungry or without an adequate education. Um, but I also want to make sure that this movement doesn't turn into just um, a platform for NIMBYism or for more exclusivity within the university because there is a very high demand for education today, and especially for low-income communities. And, but also, I, I don't think that uh, pushing low-income students into a university that does not have adequate resources for really any of their students, but especially low-income students, um, you know, that's just immoral from, in, from my perspective. Um, so I really do think that we need to support students from all backgrounds and make sure that the resources for them and for all students are adequate and really make sure that, you know, this is a happy and healthy campus for us to be living on. Um, and I also think that some development is going to need to happen to uh, help supply those resources that have happened, like, that aren't there right now and to also take some of the pressure off of the community because, uh, you know, I don't think that the enrollment is going to decrease anytime soon. Um, but clearly even students that are here right now don't have the resources that we need. I, I know tons of people that are homeless or living in cars or can't get the classes that they need. There's people sitting on the seats of my, or the sides of my lecture halls. Um, you know, no one can enroll in the classes that they want. It takes more than four years for most people to graduate. So it's really impacting our ability to have this quality education that the UCs are saying that we're supposed to be getting. Um, so finally, you know, I think that the important thing will be demanding that the university does not increase enrollment any further until current resource and housing needs are met for both students and for the community, and that a comprehensive plan ensuring that any future growth will also have those resources and will not have the same significant impacts on the community or on students. And I think that that really is the only way that we will be able to go about this. If the regions want to have any more increase in students. Um, so thank you all for letting me speak to you on the student perspective. I, I know it's hard for us to get out here to these meetings. Um, we're, we have very busy schedules, but we really do appreciate you guys trying to accommodate our, our voices as well. So. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, and now, uh, Chris Krohn, who you know is a council member, but also works up at the university as a staff member, is going to give sort of a perspective from the staff standpoint. Chris? How about first a uh, uh, hand for John Garrett and Ted Ben Murray? Woo! Thank you. Uh, Boston University, then the House Reed, when 
Hold your hand up. And thank you. I see Amy Gonzalez in the back. Student has been following this for years. Hey, Amy, want to put your hand up? Thank you very much. And a hand for the other students who are in the house, too, as well. Really appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Chris Crone, and I wear a couple different hats. I'm, of course, I'm on the San Diego City Council, but I've also been a staff member of UCSC for 13 years. My third hat is as a dad. Um, the news I bring you tonight is that things are not so well in Slugland. Really, the double-edged sword that many staff at UC Santa Cruz face are the rents are too damn high and the salaries are too damn low. A staff job when I started was a pretty good job. Not any longer. Employees were able to forego higher salaries at that time because pension and health benefits were paid for. That's no longer true. Most staff take home less now than they did 10 years ago, believe it or not. And now the growth issues. The buses rarely arrive on campus on time. I take the bus, I drive my bike, I take my car once a week. They leave Metro Center on time, pretty much always, but rarely arrive to Science Hill on schedule. The scheduled ride time is about 17 minutes, but the other day it took 35, for example. And they've got these articulated buses now. And they say, we can fit more people on the articulated buses. But guess what? The articulated buses stop. They'll never get full. And they stop more often. It takes more time to get people on and off. So the, the ride actually takes a lot longer. In the past, buses pass the students up and they, you know, because they're full. But you get, you get up to campus faster. So it, it's like they're not taking care of, of, of transportation on, on campus right now. The class I taught the other day was part of the student internship program. There were 40 students trying to sit in a classroom for 25. Um, several students had to sit on the floor. And I've been teaching the seminar for 13 years, an orientation seminar for interns. I have 270 interns this quarter. I'd like to pat myself on the back and say it's all about me. But it's not. It's, the university keeps accepting more and more and more students. And what happens is a lot of students don't get the classes that they need, so they take an internship or they take a quarter off because they can't get into the classes that they need. Um, as a staff member, I've seen resources just not keeping up with the growth. UC management, the regions at Oakland, have a lot of catching up to do. And that's before taking on another 12,000 faculty, staff, and students. So it's not just 10,000 more students, you have to add in the faculty and staff to that as well. We, we, we have to do two things as far as I can see. We have to work together as much as we can with the chancellor. Because I, I, I spoke to him there. He's not, he's not a happy camper, as you can imagine. And we have to figure out how to break the news to the regions. So people here on this side of the hill can save face. And that Santa Cruz cannot accommodate any more students past the current LRVP figure of 19,500. And we can't do that until UC shows us some more resources and gives the university and the city time to catch up and provide more housing for everyone who's already here. The 28,000 was just a figure they threw out, maybe, and they wanted to see what our response was, but I don't think it matters. We must all get together and say no to any more growth in the short term. We as a community have got to be resolved on this. No more growth now means no more growth. And when, I, and when they say, we are doing great on campus. We house 53% of the students. We're doing great managing our traffic. We are doing great conserving water on campus. Well, guess what? Only half the people live on campus. The other half live off campus here. And they don't chart that statistics when they're giving us all these statistics about how well they're doing, and they are on campus. In closing, I came here because of UCSC. I came to Santa Cruz because of UCSC. I graduated twice. I worked at the campus for 13 years, and I love UCSC, as I know most of you in this room do, and we're a much better place because of UCSC. But there's a limit to how much you know your your crazy old uncle can, how many friends they can bring home and keep packing the house, and that that's the situation we're in. Speaking as a current as a current staff member, as a community member, and as a city council member, we need to tell the university enough is enough. Vote June 5th, vote yes on Measure U to limit university growth. Thank you very much.
One more perspective from the university, that's Jim Clifford, who uh, was a professor, he's now retired. Jim? Thanks, John. <laughs> I have to say that we both went, John and I went to Haverford College, he was captain of our football team, that very occasionally won a game. And <laughs> when John was captain, we did win one game. And it was a back in the <laughs> Enough nostalgia. The, I'm, I'm here to speak as a faculty member. Uh, on the flyer, I'm associated with a group called the East Meadow Action Committee. And I just want to say very quickly uh, that I'm not speaking for East, Mac, East Meadow Action Committee. That is a, 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 a movement organized to try to stop the building of a, a careless and hasty abomination in the most exposed and beautiful meadow site on the campus. And if you want to read about why we shouldn't do that and our position, you can go to our website. It's called East Meadow Action uh, And I also want to say about East Meadow Action that there's a lineup out about us that we are nimby, nostalgic, uh, you know, old, old, oldsters who want the campus to go back to the way it was in the, in the old days and don't want anything to change. And uh, that's just really a bad rap. Uh, we are in favor of building more housing for students on campus, but a reasonable amount, yeah. not necessarily the ma this magic number of 3,000, but quite a few, enough to satisfy the compact with the city, which we think is very important, and to try to do our part at the university to alleviate the housing crisis in town. But the way it's being done is really not OK. Uh, now I'll start speaking for myself as a faculty person. Uh, the, uh, for reasons that uh, weren't uh, through no planning of ours, the East Meadow struggle that we're involving in is turning out to be a harbinger of, uh, of or the first skirmish in the longer war of the university growth. Because what we're finding is not merely the desecration of, of, of an iconic site on campus, but also a process of development and a process of planning which is top-down administrative, authoritarian, and secretive, and uh, not, uh, op not uh, committed to open discussion. And this is not a good thing uh, as we go forward and as we uh, we're about to enter the, this new long-range development process, LRBP uh, discussions and struggles for the next uh, couple of years, this uh, fight over the meadow is really just the first little fight. And, and if we can stop the university, if we could stop them from doing this, they would perhaps under, begin to understand that they can't just do whatever they want without consulting people and without taking other people's opinions into account. So far, that's really, it's been a ramming, it's ramming it through, and that's not okay. Now, as a faculty person, I'm just trying to John said, well, you can talk as a faculty person about the faculty. Well, you know, <laughs> anyone who tries to speak for the faculty is crazy. But I'll just say a few things. There's a lot of, there's diverse position among the faculty on campus. Uh, some of them are, I think, are committed, we might call them nostalgic. They're committed to the past. They really don't, they like the way the university used to be, and they really want to keep it that way at all costs. Uh, there are others who uh, are uh, very much about, who are in favor of growth because they are often many younger faculty. They want to do things. They want to do their science. They want to do their research. They know they need resources. And the only way to get resources in this game is to grow. That's the game. That's the rule that the university tells you. Uh, and then there are, I think, many people in the middle who are, are uh, who want to who are prepared for certain amounts of growth and change, but want it done responsibly and openly in dialogue uh, with interested stakeholders, and especially with the town, with the city, and who want change to be responsible and, and careful. Uh, we are not seeing that now. Uh, and uh, just to give, I'll, I'll tell you a, a story about a, a meeting that I, uh, I went to a member of the faculty did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the faculty senate had a meeting with the chancellor and the vice chancellor. And uh, at the beginning of that meeting, uh, 
uh, a colleague of ours, Onutom Narayan, who's a, a physicist and very good with budgets and numbers, uh, dropped a sort of jaw-dropping uh, statistic on us and said, well, since the last LRDP in 2005, the university has student population has grown by 20%, and the faculty have grown by 4%. Now, I'm not here to tell you that the faculty are the, the be-all and end-all and, and crucial element in quality of education at the university, but that number is all you need to know to understand why students can't get into giant classes, why they're sitting on the floor, why they are why the resources to deliver a quality education up there just aren't available. And it's not just educational, which we've heard about already, but it's also, uh, you know, crumbling dormitories, mold, which is not being fixed and making students ill. It's six students, sex steps, being jammed into what was formerly lounges. I mean, it's really uh, not okay up there. So, and when these uh, issues were raised for the chancellor. He said, yeah, it, of course, it's true. Said, we are underfunded. We are undercapitalized. We, we really don't have the resources that we need to uh, do what we should be doing. And his solution? Take more students. <laughs> and the faculty just was stunned. <laughs> I mean, they really, it was like, what? Because, he said, we cannot get any new resources out of UCOP. Unless we take more students. So the, the logic is, because we're behind now, let's take more students and be, be behind at a higher level, right? Or perhaps if you're in a hole digging and you want to get out, dig deeper. Well, uh, this is the, I'm afraid, the logic. And I don't blame George Blumenthal, I don't blame the administrators. This is a game that is imposed on them by UCOP and Sacramento. And, uh, insensitive diktats about growth and uh, basically uh, if you want any new resources, if you want any kind of support to fix the problems that you already have, the only way to do that is to dig deeper into those problems. And so well, this is crazy, I think you'll admit. And yet it's this cash money to gain that is passing for university policy. And I think we really <laughs> need to understand that. And I absolutely applaud, uh, you know, Ryan Coonerty saying we have to be talking in Sacramento, we have to be talking in Oakland. We have to. This struggle has to go there because this is where this is uh, the driving force uh, in uh, in the crisis that we all face. Uh, and so. Uh, <laughs> well, I think I said what I have to say. Uh, the fact, I'll, well, last point. Just one last point. There's a lot of diverse opinion on the, on the university, and there's a certain amount of stereotyping of the university, which we all know, and even scapegoating the university. And I think that what people need to know in town is that there are allies uh, for what Clue is about on the university. There are diverse allies, and uh, that uh, uh, coalitions and connections can be made. Uh, and I think that they're all, they, uh, the whole question of growth, which goes across a whole range of, uh, of concerns, both educational and housing and so forth, all of these uh, can be connected. And I think Blue is a, a, a really good uh, place to uh, generate that and to uh, connect with the student groups, the staff groups, the faculty groups on campus uh, who are on the same page. Thank you. We have uh, two uh, final speakers, Andy Schifrin, who uh, was active in the last round of negotiation and is the uh, senior assistant to Ryan Coonerty, and then followed up by Gary Patton. So. If you have an agenda, you know I've been asked to talk about the implications of growth. Pretty much what you've been hearing all evening. So what I want to 
try to do is maybe fill in some of the blanks um, and build on what other people have said. So my the presentation may not be as coherent as I would have wished, but um, I'll try to make it as coherent as I can. But first, um, I know many of you are very familiar with the growth process. You're very familiar with the laws. You've been involved in issues in Santa Cruz, but some of you may not. So I want to take a couple of minutes to maybe define a few terms. Um, we've talked about the LRDP, the Long Range Development Plan. Well, what is that? As you probably all know, the city and the county must have general plans. And the general plans look to the future and they're approved by the city council or the board of supervisors about what the growth of that community will be. Well, the Long Range Development Plan serves that function for the university. And periodically, they have to approve a new long-range development plan to provide the policies and the, uh, the vision of what their growth for the uh, coming years is going to be. And then when they uh, do that, they set an enrollment projection, just like uh, the city general plan will say, well, in 20 years, we're going to have so many more people, or we're going to plan for so many more people. That's what they do. Well, the university's long-range development plan has a legal, uh, a legal role. Once it's adopted, that's how much growth the university can have until it changes its long-range development plan, which it can do uh, whenever it wants, but it tends to do over the period of time. So the long-range development plan is that is existing now uh, goes to 2020, and it provides for an enrollment of uh, 19,500 uh, students. As we've heard, um, it also provided for uh, an expectation of so many new facilities um, and that would be located on campus. Well, the students are going to be here. A large chunk of the new facilities aren't going to be here, and that's part of the problem that other speakers have talked about. Um, another issue that's been uh, what Ryan really emphasized was how the university is exempt generally from local land use control. And I want to say a few words about that because it's fundamental to our powerlessness, essentially, um, in that the university can approve its long-range development plan and the city and the county have no ability to um, decide whether that's the right thing for them to do or not. However, the university is not exempt from all, uh, all regulations or all ability of the, or any ability that the community has to affect what it does. And there's one um, law that's particularly important, um, that is the California Environmental Quality Act. The university must uh, meet the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act before it approves the long, a long-range development plan. So as they're starting their new long-range development plan, since the existing one ends in 2020, the first step is they're going to come out with a, a, a draft plan, and then they're going to do an environmental impact report, which is a document under CEQA that's required to analyze the potential impacts of that plan. Um, and that's one of the areas where the community can be involved in commenting on that plan and assuring that, that, that the university really meets the requirements of the act. There's one other area where the community can have some impact on the university, and it's due to kind of a little glitch in the way uh, the university in Santa Cruz uh, happens. And that is that part of the university campus is in the city of Santa Cruz. But part of the city of the university campus is not in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, that's what's called the North Campus. And that's outside of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, much of the growth that was uh, proposed in the existing Long Range Development Plan was supposed to happen in the North Campus area. Um, under state law, the city of Santa Cruz is not permitted to provide sewer and water services to the campus, uh, to, a, to an area outside of its uh, boundaries without the approval of the Local Agency Formation Commission. And the Local Agency Com uh, Formation Commission is a, uh, a 
body that's considered a state agency, although the members, the governing body, is mostly locally elected officials. Two from the city council, two from the board of supervisors, two from special districts, and one public member elected by the rest of them. And the, the university, as part of the settlement agreement that Ted talked about, agreed to go through that process, um, although they didn't think they had to because um, and Cynthia said, when the university first came here, everybody wanted them to come. And part of wanting them to come was signing contracts saying um, the city would provide water, the city would provide sewer uh, services to the campus. However, and so the university is saying, we've got the right to that anywhere on the campus. And those of us who have a different perspective are saying, that may be true, except there's a state law that says before the city can do that, it has to go through LAFCO. As Ted alluded to in terms of um, the measures that were adopted by the city, there's the light, but I just wanted to put in perspective what the context is in which we're operating. Because while it's true that Measure U is tremendously important because it gives the representatives of the community on the city council, on the board of supervisors, in the, uh, in the groups that are active to um, challenge the university's growth projections. It gives them the sense that they're representing the community, that they're not out there all by themselves just thinking, we think it's a bad idea, so let's go try to pursue it. It's the, the public saying, this is a bad idea. The, the, uh, I, I just can't, I can't avoid saying what others have said, enough is enough, the community um, has absorbed enough, as much growth um, from the university as can really, as it can avoid and still maintain its quality of life. So um, with that as a background, I uh, started late. Um, I'll try to keep my remarks below 10 minutes. I was given an extra amount of time. But I did want to say something about, uh, I wanted to fill in the blanks so or build a little on what Cynthia Matthews said. Because in 1962, the chancellor appeared in a video for a project for Lighthouse Field, which you wouldn't believe unless you've seen The Court of the Seven Seas, which is a video that I think you can get from the library. But the chancellor was on a panel and he said, uh, by 1990, there'd be 27,500 students at the University of California in Santa Cruz. At that time, or three years later, when the city of Santa Cruz adopted a general plan, that general plan anticipated 100,000 people living in Santa Cruz by 1985. Um, we're now at 65,000. Um, that plan included a building of a highway down Ocean Street and a highway down Delaware. It included the Highway 17 becoming a probably a three-lane uh, uh, freeway. It included a freeway below the campus. It included uh, a major changes in the, in the road system. And in, uh, and the, there was a water plan that was going to have three or four major dams on the north coast of the county. None of that has happened. Uh, while the ranch was supposed to have 10,000 housing units on it, Poganip was supposed to have 1,000 housing units on it. Because of the community activism that has existed in this town, none of that is happening. We have a green belt around the community now. Um, we're mostly built out. There's not a lot more growth that can occur in the community, which is uh, one of the reasons why the quality of life is so important, and one of the reasons why continued university growth is going to have that continuing acceleration in housing prices, continuing traffic congestion, and continuing uh, pressure on our water system. The city is actively engaged in trying to find a new water supply. It's been actively engaged in that process for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, maybe it will find a new water supply. What saved us in the drought was really your conservation. The conservation of the customers was so great that it got us through the, through the drought. Continued growth is going to make that even more difficult to do in the future until a new supply occurs, if and when a feasible one is, uh, is adopted. So. Um, I think the context in which the original notion of how big the university uh, should be and would be 
has changed so fundamentally in terms of how we define a uh, desirable quality of life, what kind of community we want, and, the, and to have now the university proposing to increase the enrollment beyond its original cap seems to be um, a fairly outrageous decision on their part, which I hope that we will continue to oppose. So I don't know if John is wanting me to stop. Uh, so the, stick hasn't, the stick hasn't come up. I can say a lot more, but I will stop in the interest of time so that there's more time for questions. And thank you very much. Signed up and sign up. Yeah, she would be really helpful if you would. So, if, uh, if someone, I don't know, Dave, if, if you haven't signed up, please do. Gary Patton it is going to tell us uh, what we might be able, to, uh, what else we might be able to do. And then we'll some questions and discussion. Well, my name is Gary Patton, <laughs> and if you notice, if you notice what it really says on the agenda. It really says what's needed to stop it, Gary Patton. <laughs> I believe that I have been associated through most of my adult life, starting when I was 29 years old and first elected to the Board of Supervisors, and even a little bit before that, with the idea that we could stop things. We could stop the development of Lighthouse Field, which was a done deal. It was a done deal. And Andy, I'm not mad at you, but you said it. Community action stopped the development of Lighthouse Field. It stopped the development of Wilder Ranch. It stopped the development of Pogonit. It stopped the development of agricultural lands all over the community. It stopped North Coast development, and I got blamed for the whole damn thing. <laughs> well, I am proud to have been associated with a community that took the position that rather than letting things happen to us, we were going to try to make them happen the way we thought they should be. And this is really what I want to focus on tonight when we talk about what is needed to stop an unhealthy development of the university, unhealthy for the faculty, students, and staff. And I am now an adjunct professor at UCSD. I see a few of my former students in the crowd. Uh, there is not a healthy ecosystem on campus as well as not a healthy ecosystem in which the campus is related to the community. So there is, as Jim Clifford said, a real opportunity to work together to bring the kind of community on and off the hill that we ought to have and that we all have treasured during those times that it has existed in that way. So let me just suggest to you that out of my experience stopping things, I have a principle to suggest that we as individuals, as human beings, have the ability to be both observers and actors. And the temptation is always to observe because it is delightful to analyze and to understand and it uh, brings great joy to us as we do that. But when we just look at what's happening, we are drained of power because the plans are there. The university is independent, as Ryan and others have said tonight, independent of local control. The regents don't give a damn about us. And that, I think, is an accurate observation as an observer. So how are we going to stop it? When we observe around us, how were we going to stop Lighthouse Field? How were we going to save all the farmlands of this county? How were we to slow down the growth which 
When I was first elected to the board, we were the fastest growing county in the state of California. That's why those projections that Andy was talking about existed. And we were the fifth fastest growing county in the entire United States of America. That is true. And we stopped it. So we did that by acting by acting, not observing. It's important to observe, to take the temperature, to find out where we are, to know the laws, to know the rules, to know the plans, but much more important is what I think it was Andy, but somebody used the word resolve. It is much more important to decide we are going to change the way things are happening to us, going to make them happen the way we want them to happen. And so how do we do that? Well, this Measure U has been stressed. Suppose 80% more, 80% or more of the public in the city of Santa Cruz goes to the polls on June 5th and says, essentially, to the university, to the regents, to the chancellor, but to our elected officials, we reject the idea of future growth at this time at the University of California. Let me tell you what happens right after June 5th. There is a budget session at the board of supervisors and in the city council. And just suppose that the city and the county elected officials now having been told overwhelmingly by their constituents, we need you to stop this, and Cynthia Matthews read the language right out of there, instruct the officials. We're instructing them, put some money in the table, develop a budget, and you coordinate the effort to stop this, to build the coalitions, to get the very best legal advice and help and, and assistance, to do the studies that in the environmental impact process will prove my traffic is actually a big problem. You know, there are experts. You have to have experts to prove that. You can't just say, you know, I went out and tried to drive, and I couldn't, so I even went back home and didn't go there. It's true. A lot of people, I, you've done that, right? That's yeah, what it's true. I've done that. We've well, got two you need an roads. expert to prove We've it. We've got High Street and Bay Street. Right. You that need is. an expert. So what we're really talking about here Clue, I think, is going to play, I'm hoping, a key role mobilizing the community. Some of these former students of mine are organizing students, as we heard. The staff and the faculty are energized, partly because of the offensive project and support Jim Clifford and his 50,000 petition signers uh, that oppose that East Meadow project. We are going to be determined and we are going to mobilize our local government resources. And there are, I'd like to say, working backwards from the vote, 26 regions. They are charged, ultimately, with making a decision. It means we need 14 regions. I've got the list. I'm not going to read it to you. We are going to have to go to the legislature, as Ryan said. We're going to have to deal with the regions. But if we insist we are not going to let this projected future happen to us because it's wrong, it's wrong for the campus and it's wrong for the community, I think, no guarantees, I think we're going to prevail. And here is the example that you haven't thought about. You've thought about Poconet and you've thought about uh, White House Field and Wilder Ranch. People have forgotten that the federal government, at least as unconcerned with Santa Cruz as the regions, <laughs> had a massive plan for offshore oil development in California, including directly off the Santa Cruz County North Coast. And you know what happened? Santa Cruz County, our local board of supervisors, I was one of those guys, we hired somebody to coordinate 
local governments and others up and down the coast. We ultimately develop ordinances to make it difficult for the oil companies to win. We ended up for 20 years, 20 years we had to fight it every year, we ended up defeating the greatest economic power in the history of the world, the oil companies, at the federal government level. The regions are a piece of cake. Oh yes on Measure U, we're going to win. Now we're, we're, we've got some time for some questions and for some discussion. And so if you just hold up your hand and I'll acknowledge you. I, I did want to first say that I, I wanted to recognize Don Stevens who founded Clue all, all that many years ago. And so Don, do you have any uh, question or comment you want to make? Yeah, I'd just like to follow up on uh, what Andy and Gary have been talking about on, on winning. And uh, I think one of the keys, as uh, Andy alluded to, is the North Campus, where most of the development is proposed, and which UCSC does not currently have access to. And the LAFCO uh, state agency, the local uh, chapter, governs whether or not uh, the city can provide water and sewer to that area. UCSC has a different opinion, of course, saying absolutely the city must provide it, but I think uh, their case is actually on much weaker legal grounds, and I would encourage uh, the city, and I actually, they probably don't need my encouragement, but to never give in on that point, because that is our strongest point of legal leverage against, the UC, against UCSC, and I think it's powerful. Uh, and likely a winning point. Um, but this this is on the assumption that Gary believes we're going to convince 14 regions, and I, I am not going to uh, they say that. But should that fail, we can stop them from getting the North Campus. That's a thousand acres up there. If they get in there, there will, they will never be stopped, because you open the door and they're in there. So I think that's a critical thing. The other point I wanted to make regards the uh, 1,100 acres of property that UCSC owns in Marina, formerly Fort Worth. It was given to them by the federal government in 1994. And uh, they have a plan, uh, they have had a plan for over 20 years to create a, uh, what they call some kind of high-tech technology hub where they want to build buildings and rent it out to uh, Tim Cook and uh, you know whoever else, and they have this dream of you know kept collecting lots of rent down there. Uh, CSU Monterey Bay was also given property uh, right next door. They've created uh, a campus. They are educating students there. Uh, I think the way that UCSC has been using that property down there. Oh, by the way, they built two buildings. They have vacancies available and no tech tenants. And this is after over 20 years of operating that property. So I'm pushing and hoping that our elected officials and everyone will jump on the bandwagon and say, hey, UCSC, here is a chance for you to build a new campus in Marina. They have 500 acres slated for development. 127 acres are already approved. They have roads, sewers, power, water, everything. And they're not doing anything with it. So I think it's scandalous, um, but I also think it's a potential solution to our problem here in Santa Cruz where we can satisfy the regents, we can satisfy the need for higher education in the state, you could say do our share in a sense, uh, at least UCSC, Chancellor Bumacall could say, hey, we're, we're going to build a new campus and we could have, you know, we could accommodate 20,000 students there. UCLA, for example, has I think 47,000 students and they have about 450 acres. So 500 acres that are slated, that are flat, it's a lot cheaper to build. I don't want to take up any more time, but I just wanted to throw in my two bits and also that um, as an offshoot of Clue, uh, another a more stricter environmental group called Habitat and Watershed Caretakers. We sued the university over their attempt to get into the North Campus and uh, we prevailed. 
so we can't be done. We can't win. One other uh, person here, and then just take uh, questions and comments. Maxine Jimenez is here, uh, who is the student body president of uh, the assembly president for Upland University. So, Maxine? I'm right here. Where are you? Yeah, there you are. Hi. Okay. Anyway, thanks so much for coming, Maxine. Feel free to jump in at any point. So, questions, comments? Yes. I'm Terry Maxwell. I've lived in Santa Cruz for a number of years. Long prior, I was at UCSC for two summers in the uh, early 70s. And if, I'm so disappointed in the, if you will, the dichotomy of interests and the, the mismanagement of UCSC internally and externally in its attitude towards the community. It's obvious the water is gone. Speaking of the water, when the agreement was signed for the university to come here and have support from the community, no one could foresee what is known in English Anglo-American law as changed circumstances. And those changed circumstances are we have a water shortage, among other factors. That alone should have been enough, uh, I'll say to Gary Patton, and to the, the city government to have brought a successful legal challenge somewhere, anywhere English is spoken, Your Honor, the circumstances are different. We no longer have a mutual understanding that the law should enforce regarding the university's demand for city support. Plain and simple. Uh, I'm very disappointed that wasn't done. Let me share a little bit of what Ralph Nader taught me when I worked with Ralph Nader. Defeating government stupidity and corporate greed. Uh, Gary's approach, your strategy, I want to applaud everybody. I didn't realize how great an effort you could I'm undertaking it, but I'm going to be short and say, absolutely give them hell and absolutely get uh, Bill Mine and Stone to make this a forefront issue with the state legislature. And I'm disappointed that neither Mr. Money nor Mr. Stone are here tonight. Everybody can follow up with that. Other comments, questions? Yes. Does the university have any alternatives to last go or? Uh, there doesn't seem to be. Uh, they applied to LAFCO, and then when that was during the period where we had the drought, and they decided to pull it because they realized they were not going to get it approved. And, and so they did not actually had the process go through. So I think they, notwithstanding their argument that they're not obligated to go through, I think in fact uh, they are, and that's the position we would take. Let me just offer a little bit uh, uh, kind of explanation. Uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Stevens here, he sued them over the EIR for their application, and he won on some points, and that just completely bottled them up in LAFCO, and so they never pursued the application in LAFCO, which is what happened. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Oh, wait, let me just add one other thing. Uh, we are meeting with uh, Assemblyman Stone uh, in the next couple of weeks to talk about this. Uh, Mr. Monty couldn't accommodate us, but we'll have scheduled another meeting with him. So uh, we hopefully we're going to get them on board with this. Can I have one point about that? Sure. Yeah. Just to clarify on the LAFCO process, the city is the entity that has to apply to LAFCO to extend the water and, service, uh, water and sewer to UCSC. So the UCSC cannot force the city to do that, although they can try to they can try to sue them and all that, but it, the city has strong legal grounds. So I doubt UCSC would prevail on that. So as long as the city uh, refuses to apply to LAFCO, then they UCSC can't get the water and sewer. There's gonna be a legal fight over it. There's gonna be a big battle on it. There's gonna be lawsuits. The UCSC will begin suing uh, LAFCO and the city, but I hope we can that our city will stand firm. Great, thanks, Tom. Another question. What if the university <laughs> declares a state of emergency? 
oh, I'm going to state an emergency concerning their water and sewer. Yeah. Sewer? Yeah. Water and sewer, yeah. Well, they're not going to have a, an emergency unless they grow, and they can't grow without, uh, and certainly not in the, as Don said, on the North Campus, if that's part of the plan, they've got to get uh, service extended there. So, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to accept students and then need to go up there without having that uh, opened up. So, listen, has this been help? Oh, there's another. Well, you said there's a campus in Merced. Um. Just a second. The campus you were set. Why do you think it is that they're they're trying to enlarge our enrollment and not that one? They don't have our. Would you rather be in Merced or Santa? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, in, in, in point of fact, uh, each of the campuses is going through or has come through uh, the same sort of long range development plan. So Merced is not exempt from that. But one of our arguments would be. That's your new campus. Build that. And as Don said, Marina is another example, and that's in our own, you know, sphere under the UCSC uh, sort of system here locally. But there are other alternatives for sure. And our argument is, uh, this community is is the host for this. It's the smallest host community in the state of California. Enough's enough. We've got to catch up with the last round of growth. And, uh, you know, this is not a time to be approving a 50% increase in the student body. John, so. I think an important fact we should all remember is that the projected growth rates for all the UC campuses has UC Santa Cruz growing at a 10 times faster rate than the other campuses except, I believe, Riverside. But so it's all disproportionate growth in the, the campus which can least accommodate it. It's obscene. It's a very good question about Merced. Only 6,800 students in Merced. So it has capacity to grow. I don't know how they feel about it, but here it's just unacceptable. One of the things that we've pressed for for all the years that we've been involved in this is for the uh, office of the UC president to tell us just how they set the quotas for the various campuses. And they're totally opaque on that. And they've never gotten an answer in even a gentle sort of way of how they do that. And uh, obviously we'll be moving to that. But we just don't know how they do that. Any other questions? One more. I just wanted to know if you Could somebody, could somebody please explain to me the formula they're using that student growth will bring in more money that will pay for more facilities and faculty? I don't, I don't get that formula. Well, at the Citizens Advisory Group meeting on the LRDP, which John and I are part of and some of the other people in this room are part of, uh, Chairman Blumenthal got up in the beginning identified uh, some vague kind of qualification or classification that the university gets for when it achieves a certain size. You recall what he said about that? And I don't, I, we have another meeting on that next week and we're discussing exactly what that means, but apparently they think that they achieve this next level of growth that they then get worldwide recognition Research grants and the rest of the fall. Bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. No, that, 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 excuse me, just a second. Oh. Hi, um, I'm Max, and I'm the president of the Student Union Assembly. And as some of you might know, the SUA recently endorsed um, passed a resolution to stop over increased over enrollment. Um, you know, in the terms of that we get the resources we need in order to be able to live there um, and have housing and have our basic needs met. And so I just wanted to address the question that was asked. Is it okay if you repeat that really quickly? Because I might be able to answer it. Oh, sure. What is the formula they're using that shows 
increase in uh, student yeah. enrollment will be increased funds for facilities and faculty. Okay, so that's not like a one, it doesn't have one answer. Um, I think that a lot of people have mentioned the UC Regents. Um, I think we also need to mention the governor and the UC president, Janet Napolitano, because they're actually the ones who negotiate that number. And right now, UCOP, which is the UC Office of the President, are the folks who have this, that, that formula that you're talking about where they assess. So. Janet Napolitano and the governor, they negotiate this number um, that they, how they want the whole UC to grow um, in terms of number, numbers of students. And so what they do is that um, they kind of assess each campus. I'm not exactly sure how that is, but it, I mean, I'm, I'm sure land is involved, like how much land is involved in like a lot of the zoning policies. Um, but it doesn't take into consideration like how much it costs, and every UC gets fairly the, the same amount for development, which is not enough. Um, and so students are the ones, like, are one of the folks who are feeling most of the impact since they end up homeless and we lose a lot of spaces on campus. And so that number that they come up with is not always, is not accurate at all. And, in, and to elaborate a little bit on the grants, um, so the UC has a mission to make sure that they create this community that's diverse and making sure that they give um, Californians access to education and that's kind of where this enrollment number is coming in. And so they have this thing called a two to one ratio and you might want to look that up too because I'm not sure if I can explain it very well myself, but pretty much the two to one ratio is that for every two undergrad students, there's a there's one transfer student or one non-traditional student. And what and right now it's like really complicated because that also is one of the excuses that they use in order to increase growth um, on campus. And there's also a fifty million dollar grant that's attached to that. So if the every UC who meets that um, that requirement, they are able to get that money as well. But we're not exactly sure that money doesn't always go to the, you know, to faculty or to workers or to the resources that students need in order to do well in school. Um, I'm not, the only reason why I was hesitant on speaking is because I don't know what's been talked about before, so I'm trying to catch myself up. Um, I can, I'm willing to ask where they get that formula from, too, and I can, I don't know who I give that to, but. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, th that is a key question, though, and that is one of the issues that we've demanded or requested <coughs> that the university explain, is what is their formula, how do they allocate students to campuses, uh, you know, what, what's the system, the, met the metrics that they use to decide that Santa Cruz needs 10,000 more students, and how does that relate to Merced, or Riverside, or UCLA, and so forth, so. Listen, let's, I think it's time to, oh, one more, more, more questions, okay, sure. Well, I have an announcement. My name is Astrid Madrana, and I'm a UCSC student as well. I'm here to represent HEC, uh, Quality Education in the UCs, and we are a coalition building organization on campus that is dedicated to improving the quality and accessibility uh, in the UCs, and so our mission is to our mission is to impact the UC administration and the, set, the state officials so that we can build those strong coalitions and not only between the students but the community members, the faculty members, the professors and the, the decision makers. And so we encourage students to build those coalitions with the community and we effectively engage ourselves with the peers, the community and the local um, institutions and decision makers and so we're actually going to have an event that is going to host UCOP Robin Holmes Sullivan. We want you guys all to come here, come to our event because the UC administration will be there and the UC SC leadership will be there and we want to show them that we are in solidarity and so the event will be May 17th and we will send out an email to Clue 
uh, just for further details. And yeah, I hope to see you guys there. Great. Oh, that's great. Okay. Is there any other final question? Well, listen, I really want to uh, express appreciation for everybody turning out. Let's give a one final round of applause to all the presenters. Thank you so much.